Today's daf we're going to be learning is Ketubot Lamed Aleph. This is the daf for Shabbat. Um, because Tisha B'Av is Motzei Shabbat, and there's a custom not to learn on Tisha B'Av, so I'm going to be posting Tisha B'Av's daf already on Friday, and that way if anybody wants to learn before Shabbat, if you have time to learn three dapim, um, you're welcome to. Otherwise, you can learn it after Tisha B'Av. Uh, okay, with that, we'll get started. Today's staff is sponsored by Deborah Ashheim in loving memory of her mother, Edith Ashheim, Alain Shalom. She left this too young, but she left a lasting and loving legacy, including a love of Yiddishkeit. She was born in Vienna in 1926, went on the kinder transport to London, and was blessed to be reunited with her parents in USA in December 1940. She embraced all that New York City had to offer. Mommy, you are forever in my heart. Okay, we're going to get started on our daf at the beginning of the daf. Goof. What we saw yesterday was this, we're really getting into this very meaty topic of kim lebed rabamine, when you have two, two punishments, you get the more severe one. That's normally said when you're talking about court-inflicted punishments. Comes Rabbi Nechunya ben Akane, and he says, even when it relates to karet, or maybe even possibly any mitapetim, we saw that yesterday, difference between rava and abaye, uh, sorry, any mitabi de shamayim, any God-given death penalty, not necessarily only karet, or maybe only karet. In any case, we now have this case that Rav Chista said, we'll start with that right now. Gufa always means we're going to go in depth into something. We're going to have two gufas today. Amar Rav Chista modet Rabbi Nechunya ben Akane begonev chabol shal chabero v'achalo shu chayav shekvar en tchayev b'gneva kodem shevo lidei isor chel. If somebody steals the chel of the forbidden fats of his friend and he eats them, there's no kimle. Why is there no kimle? Even though chel of his curry and stealing is money, well, first he lifted it. Lifting means he didn't he acquired it. That means at that moment, he's liable for stealing. If I hold something of yours, I'm not liable for stealing until I lift it or do some sort of kinyan, some sort of acquiring. We'll get all to kinyanin when we get to Masechet uh, Kiddushin. But at that moment, he was obligated when he picked it up in stealing. Only later when he ate it was he chayav in chayla. To which the Gemara suggests, Lema pligi de Rabbi Avi. Rabbi Avi, we're going to deal with a lot today, which is maybe he disagrees with Rabbi Avi. Why? Well, Rabbi Avi was talking about a different case, and you might remember this from Sechet Shabbat if you learned it, which is the Amar Rabbi Avi, Hazorek Chet, Mitchilat Arba Lesof Arba. Somebody shoots an arrow that goes four cubits in the public domain. One of the main, one of the malachar on Shabbat is not to carry something, move an item, four cubits in the public domain. So I shot an arrow, okay? Now, you have to remember one main important thing about Shabbat, which is in order to be a liable for carrying or passing an object, four cubits of Rashid Rabim in public domain, there has to be an akira and a hanachah. There's two parts to it. It has to be that you picked it up and you put it down. This is the first mission in Shabbat. What if I pass it to someone and they put it down, right? Then we don't have the same both things happening. Again, it might be forbidden on a rabbinic level, but not on a Torah level. In order for Kimle, the Rav Aminei to kick in, it has to be Torah level because you only get curried if you did the Torah level punishment. If the rabbi said, well, it's close, you're going to, that's not curried. So now, I mean, the rabbi said, this is similar, we're going to forbid it, that's not curried. So now he shoots this arrow in Rashid Rabin, four cubits, and on the way, the arrow tears through Right, you have a clothesline hanging and you have this beautiful silk shirt and it goes right through it. The arrow goes right through it and ruins your shirt. Patul, why? Why are you exempt? You know, theoretically, you might say, when are you obligated in Shabbat when the, when, when the thing lands? When are you obligated in stealing when it went through the shirt? So what does Rabbi Abin say? Because you need both the moving it from the original spot until it lands in the second spot, and both of those are important parts, we view the whole action of which you're obligated on Shabbat as a continuum that begins from when the arrow is shot until the arrow lands. That's all the part of when you're obligated in Shabbat. And in the middle of that time, you hit and destroy this object, Chiyuv Shabbat and Chiyuv Neva, they all happened all at the same time. So what does that have to do with us? Well, in our case, what happened? You stole the chalev, you lifted it, and then you ate it. Now, why did you lift it if not to eat it? 
So, hachanami, hagbaha, tzorach achila. You might say this is quite different, and the Gemara will make some distinctions. But basically what they're saying is the only reason you lifted it was to eat it, right? You can't eat something unless you, unless you lift it. So basically the lifting is in order to enable you to eat, which means we view this as one continuum of an action, in which case there should be kim lebe de rabba mine. And Rabbi Nehuis, Rav Chista said, Rabbi Nehuis, Rabbi Nehuis said, there isn't because first you lifted it, then you ate it. To which the Gemara has two answers. Number one, hachi hashta, what, you're going to compare these two? Hatam i afshalanacha belo akira. There's no way to put it down if you didn't, pick it up and move it, right? You can't just shoot an arrow without having it leave one spot and land in another spot. But you can actually eat something without lifting it. How so? You can bow down, right? Bend down on the floor like a dog and or a cat, right? And eat it off the floor. So since you don't need, Hagbaha is not a necessary uh, action before you eat something, you could, right, nobody really eats like that, but theoretically you could. Inami, alternative explanation, with the arrow, if you wanted to change your mind once you shot that arrow, right, there's no change in your mind. That inherently connects the akira and hanacha because there's no way to stop it. However, if you picked it up and you wanted to eat it, and then you decide, you know what, I'm not going to eat it. You could. That basically separates these two actions. They're not totally interconnected. To which the Gemara says, So what's the difference between these two, these two options? Well, let's say you were carrying a knife in the public domain. Okay, you weren't careful like my mother always taught me, put, put it down, right? You were carrying it straight out. And on the way, you tore through somebody's shirt. So in this case, if you say, look, I could never have put that knife down wherever I'm putting it if I hadn't picked it up and started moving it. So Akira and Adachar are interconnected. And really this is viewed as one continuum. So this would be one continuum. But Iyamalt, sorry, so Ihachi, this would be, sorry, Hachanami, this case you would say the same thing. But But if you say, you can't go back when you shoot that arrow. There's no, right? There's no, a contr- you know, thing that allows you to pull the arrow back to you if you changed your mind. Right? Nowadays, by the way, that might be different. You could control it better, right? Imagine a drone, I don't know, shoot something out. You could, theoretically, there are certain situations where you could pull it back. I don't know, maybe not. But I imagine there's some technology somewhere there could be where you could actually uh, bring it back. But assuming we're talking about basic arrows, there's no way to get that arrow back. Whereas in the case of the knife, yes, you started moving with it, but theoretically you could decide you're not going to bring it four cubits, which means that the Akira and Anachar are not considered one continuum, in which case Kimle theoretically could happen. Because I'm sorry, Kimle wouldn't happen because we review them as two different times, right? There's the time you started is not really inherently connected with the time you ended, in which case, if you tear, tore something on the way, you'd be liable first for tearing, and only when you put it down would you be liable for Shabbat. And then the law of Kimle wouldn't apply. What did we do so far? We took the statement of Rav Chis about Rabbi Nechuni ben Akadet with the Chalef case, and we said, maybe Rabbi Avi disagrees, because Rabbi Avi talked about this Akira Tzorach Hanacha, maybe you'd say Hagbaha is Tzorach Achila. And then we made two distinctions and said, no, that's not true. We can't necessarily assume that Rabbi Avin would disagree with Rav Chista. Now we're going to go into Rabbi Avin and we're going to raise a question against Rabbi Avin. And then we're going to have three different methods of resolving this contradiction. Okay, that was the statement we just saw. You shoot your arrow. The Akira begins and continues, right? The whole, that whole five seconds that the arrow is being shot is all viewed as one moment. Within that moment, you've done the Gneva and you've been obligated in Shabbat. So, right, you're liable. Mativ Rabbi Barabai. Rabbi Barabai, the son of Abai, says, but wait, we have a Tosefta in Baba Kama that says the following. Hagonev kis b'Shabbat. If you steal somebody's wallet on Shabbat, Chayav. You're liable. Because when you stole it, you stole it, you picked it up, it became yours. Only later did you carry it out to Rashid Arabi, right? So when you carry it into the public domain, 
then you're obligated in Skila, but first you became obligated in Geneva. However, if you never lifted it to acquire it, but you dragged it on the floor, when do you become liable then? If you didn't lift it and have some sort of Kenyan on it, you dragged it on the floor. You're now going to be exempt. Why? Because when you obligated for Geneva, when you took it out into the public domain, when you obligated in Shabbat, when you took it out into the public domain. So therefore, we're going to assume this all happens at once. Later on today, we're going to get to when exactly you're obligated when you steal an object. Lifting it up, what if I'm still in your domain? I mean, I, I'm not really, because if I'm in your house and I pick something up, right? It's still in your domain. I haven't really stolen it. When does stealing kick in? We're going to talk about this later. Right now, let's just read it, the simple reading that I lifted it, I'm already liable. When I drag it, though, I'm not. And therefore, in that case, Chiyuv Shabbat will all happen at the same time as the Chiyuv Geneva. So now we'll go back to the first case. When I lifted it, I'm not ob I'm obligated in stealing, not yet obligated in Shabbat, until I take it out into Rishon Rabin. But won't we say, am I? Ha-chanami lema hagbahat sorachotzai. Just like Rabbi Avin, you said that Akira is Sarah It's all viewed as one continuum. Why did I lift it up when I was in your house to steal it, to take it outside? That's all viewed as one continuum. I only lifted it in order to get it out. So, Gemara says, well, what could be the case? By the way, you could answer that, again, they're not viewed as one continuum because you could change your mind, it, like they answered before. They don't answer that. Theoretically, you could answer that. But if you say there was irreversible, Right, I'm sorry, one second. Right, no, that's the one, right? You could say here it's irreversible. If you said there it's because you can't do one without the other, right? So here really, you're not gonna lift it up if not to take it out. So the Gemara says, ha ha what's the case? Answer number one, you lifted it first in order to hide it. You weren't planning to take it just yet. You were planning to hide it somewhere. And only later, then nimlach and then you changed your mind, Botsio, and decided to take it out. That means that basically when you lifted it, you weren't lifting it in order to take it out. And that's why it's not viewed as one continuum. And with that, again, you'd have to say the simple reading of the, the Tosefta is not really the way we're going to read it. We're going to do what's called a Mkimta. Say it's in a particular case where you intended to hide it and not to take it out. If you really intended to take it out, then we would view it as one continuum and you wouldn't be liable for the stealing because stealing, right, the lifting was just to take it out, and the taking out, you're already obligated Shabbat, so you're not going to be obligated to pay. To which the Gemara says, wait a minute, if you intended, lifted it up to hide it, and then decide to take it out after, would you even be liable on for Shabbat? Forget about Kimli. There's no Chi of Shabbat in that case. Why not? If you're moving things around in your house, which is permitted on Shabbat, and then you decided, you know what, as I'm moving it, maybe I'll move it outside. It'll look better out there, or I want it out of my house, and you bring it into the public domain. Patul, right? We're not talking about you put it in your yard. We're talking about you put it in the street. Votsian, patul. Why are you exempt? Did you just take something out into the public domain? Well, the same way we learned in Masech Shabbat that there's all sorts of exceptions to rules. Shelo haita akira misha'ari shona lekach. Again, this is only on a Torah level. Don't go doing this. It's forbidden by rabbinic law, but not by Torah law. Why? Because your akira, remember, you need two actions. You need the akira and the hanacha. You need to uproot it from its original location and then put it down in a new place. In this case, when you uprooted it, you were uprooting it with the right intent. You wanted to just carry it somewhere in your house. When you eventually placed it down, then you decide on putting it somewhere else, but you're missing an akira for the purposes of a, you know, something forbidden. So you're actually not liable. So the Gemara says, okay, that option then is rejected. It can't be that you did it lahatsnio because you actually wouldn't be liable for Shabbat in that case. So lo tem not lahatsnio. Second answer to the question, to the contradiction that Rabbi Barabai raises from this Tosefta against Rabbi Avin. Ela ema al minat lahotzio. You did it intending to take it out, because otherwise it wouldn't make sense. But again, in Ukimta, that Tosefta, when you stole this wallet on Shabbat, and you're not liable because you picked it up in Muchayev and Geneva first, then you moved it outside, and then you were Chayev and Hotza'a. What's the case? How, and why don't we say you lift it up in order to take it out? That's all one continuum. It's where you stopped in the middle and you stood. 
Okay? Now, if you stand, then what happens? Your akira, then your hanacha for the first akira, which is the one where you stole it, that you then put it down, you're still in the same domain. You're not obligated in Shabbat. When you then move two minutes later, however many minutes later, you move again, you have a new akira, and that's the one that you're obligated in Shabbat. So your first lifting of it had nothing to do with your taking it outside. It was a break in the middle. To which the Gemara says, well, it depends what kind of a break. Amad Lamai, you stop for what reason? If just to fix it on your shoulder and make it more comfortable, right? Seeing as you're carrying a bag, you need to just fix it. Or Well, that's a normal manner of doing things. Of course, you're going to be obligated. That doesn't count as a stop. That's just part of your, you know, you still uprooted it back then. The moment you stole it, you then just kind of adjust it on your shoulder and keep moving on. That doesn't count as a break. It must be you stop to rest. Aval, okay, so fine. You stop to rest, and then the actions become separated. First, you're liable for stealing. Then later, you're liable for when you start walking the second time, and then bring it outside. You're liable for Shabbat. That's where there's no law of Kimlet. So then the Gemara says, wait a minute. Aval katef man. So you're saying if I'm just adjusting it, patul, I'm exempt. Well, if so, look at that Tosefta. The Tosefta had said, let's go back for a minute, and then we'll go back to, we're, we're starting now on Amu Bet. Right, you're liable because first, then the skila. That's if you stood to rest. But if you drag it, you're exempt. Now, if the distinction we're making here is standing to rest versus standing to adjust, shouldn't the Tosefta have said that? If you're just dragging it, you're exempt. It should have said in. in in the middle of that Tosefta. It should have said that. It should have specified that we distinguish between standing to rest and standing to, to adjust. And, right, this doesn't make any sense. If it was the case that this was our answer, that it's Omed Lozio and you stood, it should have said so in the Tosefta. It's always kind of a problem when you have an Ukimta. If it's so clear that it's a unique case, why didn't the bright, why didn't the, the Tani Itik source say so? So, it's a bit of a question, but that's what they ask. And they, often they bring this as question, although not always. So third answer to the contradiction. Elahamane ben Azaihu. He, we should say that this Tosef is ben Azai's opinion. dami. He has a different view of this. Every step you take, he says, as with the song, right? Every step you take is a new movement. Each step, you're doing an akira and anacha, because with each step, you're basically breaking. You, right? As you put your foot down, that's a break. So that's why the first step you take, right, when you lift it up, that's stealing. But it's not yet moving you to taking out because you still have a few steps till you get there. It's only the very last step before you cross over the threshold between the private domain and the public domain. That's when you become obligated. So now we're going to have the same question. Okay, so wait. If that's the case, let's come up with a case where you wouldn't have that. What would that be? Zorik. If you throw it, then the akira, right? You lift it to throw. As you lift it, you're doing the kinyan and, and you're throwing it at the same time. And the right, the lifting is for the purposes of throwing. And then there's no steps you're taking. And then it lands, right? From your throw, all of that happened at the same time. So zoreik my patu, you be exempt. Well, if that's the case, let's go back to our question we just had a minute ago. Niflog Right, you should have distinguished that in the Tosefta. Should have said It's only if you're walking. But if you throw it, you'll be exempt. So, to which the Gemara answers, well, maybe you should have said that the Tosefta, but it specifically chose Megarer Viotze for a different reason. Megarer Viotze Itzrichale. They were trying to give one exception. They brought that one. Why? You might remember this, that in Masechet Shabbat, in order to be liable for carrying or any malacha, has to be done in the normal way that malacha is normally done. Now, normally, when you carry things, you don't drag them on the floor. So you might have thought, you might have thought, this isn't the normal way of carrying things. Therefore, it comes to teach you, even though it's not necessarily the normal way of carrying things, you're still obligated, to which we're going to have to figure out why. So be mine. What kind of item are we talking about? If you're trying to drag a couch, which is very heavy, or first of all, you wouldn't even be a question. 
That's the normal way you do it. So that wouldn't be, you wouldn't need to teach us that. If it's really small and you drag it on the floor, love or you're definitely not obligated. That is not a normal way of doing it. So it must be something that's in between, like a chair that you might carry, but you also might drag. And that's what we're talking about, that if you drag it out, you are going to be liable for Shabbat and your Geneva is going to be at the same time because you didn't lift it up. And even though you might have thought that it's not, because it's not the normal way of carrying a chair, but we say it is, okay? Now, that's our third answer and our final answer, the only one that actually worked in order to explain the contradiction between Rabbi Avin and this Tosefta, and that's the, the, basically the Tosefta knocks out Rabbi Avin, well, it must be the Tosefta has been Aze, who has this unique interpretation about Mahalech Ka'omed, and that's why when you lift it up, it is Tzorek Hotza'ah, but what's the issue? It's not really because it's only the last step that makes it Tzorek Hotza'ah, and the first step is when you stole it, it had nothing to do with taking it out, even though you're walking toward the door, doesn't matter, it's only the last step that counts for Shabbat. And that's why there's no law of Kimli. Now the Gemara wants to know, wait a minute, we have a separate issue. Where are you taking it out? If you're taking it out to the public domain, which is what we thought all along, so that works fine for the Shabbat issue because you're liable for taking something from the private domain to the public domain. That's the Malachan on Shabbat. But but you're actually not obligated for stealing something until you bring it into your own domain. Now we're going to see this as a subject of debate. When you're actually obligated for stealing. When I'm in your house and I pick it up, so I'm not yet obligated in stealing really. It's only once I bring it to my house. So if I bring it to your to the public domain, I'm not yet obligated. If it is I bring it into a private domain and then I could be obligated. Well, Shabbat Leika. But to bring something from a public, a private domain to another private domain, if I want to carry something for your house to my house, so we don't have an Eruv, I can't do it on a rabbinic level, but on a Torah level, it's actually not forbidden. So what's the case? And one doesn't have a Shabbat issue, one doesn't have a Geneva issue. And obviously, we have to have something that's both a problem for Shabbat and for Geneva. Otherwise, there's nothing to discuss here. So we're going to come up with this in between. You brought it to the sides of the public domain. We talked about this just a few days ago. They had these stones or something blocking off pillars, maybe blocking off the sides of the public domain. Normally people walked in the center, but if there were a lot of people in the public domain, they would overlap into these side areas. So they're kind of in between public and private. So now we're going to say, well, and that resolves our problem, but not exactly. Come on. Well, it depends how you perceive these Sidei Rishud Rabim. There's a debate about it. Ike Rabbi Le'ezer Damart, Sidei Rishud Rabim, Ki Rishud Rabim Dami. He says that Sidei Rishud Rabim are like Rishud Rabim, Rabbi Le'ezer. So if you view it as Rishud Rabim, well, then again, we're back to square one. Isur Shabbat Ika, Isur Gnei Valeka. Then you're not liable for stealing. Well, even though you are for Shabbat. And we need something that you would have both. Ike Rabbanan, what about the rabbis who disagree with Rabbi Le'ezer? Well, they say, Sidei Rishud Rabim, a lav Ki Rishud Rabim Dami. They're not like the public domain. In which case, Isur Gneva Ika, Isur Shabbat Leika. Again, we're back to square one. In that case, there'd be no problem of, it would be a problem of stealing, there'd be no problem with Shabbat because it's not public domain. So to which the Gemara answers two answers. First is, Leolam ki Rabbi Leezer. It goes like Rabbi Leezer. The chi ama Rabbi Leezer, the sidei reshut ha-rabim, ki reshut ha-rabim dami, ha-nimile le-inyan chi yuvad de-shabbat. We're now going to say that Rabbi Leezer maybe would distinguish between laws of Shabbat and laws of skill. When it comes to laws of Shabbat, we're going to treat it like the public domain because sometimes there's an overflow and many people go there. And therefore, don't bring objects into the public domain. This is considered the public domain because sometimes it's a public domain. But when we're talking about having a Kenyan on something you stole and then lifting it in this public domain or, or transferring it from the private domain from the robber's house into this area on the side of Rashid Arabim. Well, we're going to consider that that you acquired it. My time, because there are multitudes of people walking through here, and therefore it's not an issue. Um, I'm sorry, it is an issue, right? Therefore, it's not considered public domain for this purpose, which means you brought your item there, you basically acquired it. So that's a answer number one. We're going to resolve it according to our Blazer and say that he views it depending on the issue. For Shabbat, public. For stealing and basically acquiring, private. Now, Rav Asha gives a different answer. And this is a whole new thing, which is, 
you were, your hand was under three tvachim. You didn't actually lift it, but you basically transferred it into your other hand. Now, what does that do? Well, kidderava. As Rava says, Rava, yado shaladam chashuvalo ke arba'a al arba'a. Your hand, okay, this comes up also in yado ke chatsero. This comes up in gitin about if you give a get to the woman, it has to be in her possession. Putting it in her hand is basically like her possession. It's like a space of four by four tvachim, four by four hands, but which is a private domain. So by putting it in your hand, you're basically transferring it to, you're, you're basically acquiring it. And then you're doing at the same time, right? Your hand is in the public domain. So you're transferring it to the public domain at the same moment that you're acquiring it for the purposes of theft, because you're putting it into your other hand, which basically means even though I'm in the pub, my hand's in the public domain, it doesn't matter. My hand itself is like a private space within the public domain. So Rav Acha, Mat Nehach. Rav, Acha, Rav Acha learns it like this. The putting in your hand is like Arba'a, Arba'a, and therefore that would be the case. Ravina Matle Laolam de Afke Lirishitarabim. He has a whole different approach. He says, No, you can actually take it into Rashid Arabim. Ubershidarim Nami Kana. He has a different approach to what we've been saying until now. She says, You bring this into the public domain, you've acquired it just by putting it in the public domain. Well, no issue of you took it out of the robber's house and into the public domain. At that moment, you've acquired no, nothing like you have to put it into a private domain or you have to put it into your hand, it has to be like some sort of transfer. No. Just by bringing it into the public domain, you have actually acquired it. So again, we see there's different approaches to this whole thing of stealing. It's a whole interesting topic in and of itself. We'll learn a lot when we get to Baba Kama about stealing when you're liable for stealing. So now, Travayu, these two opinions, they both argue about how to derive this law from the following Mishnah. Ditznan. Okay, it's a Mishnah in Baba Kama. Haya Moshchovi Yotze. I told you the main subject here, the main topic is in um, the seventh chapter, Prat Maruba Vavakama. Haya Moshchovi Yotze, Umet Bereshut Balim Patur. If you're dragging it, and now here we have a, a guy who steals an animal. And as you're stealing the animal, the animal dies. Are you responsible, right? And if you steal it and then it's yours and then it, it dies under your, your um, jurisdiction, your bit, or and it's not the right word, but your domain then you're responsible. So the question is, at what point are you considered the, that you stole it? So if I steal your, your uh, ox and I'm dragging it out and it dies, I'm still in your house when it dies, I'm actually not obligated. He could be home, but if I lifted it, I don't know how you lift a shore, but I guess it's some other object you lift. Oh, or I took it out of your domain, and then it dies, I'm obligated. So Ravina Ravina derives his halacha from the beginning part, Rav Ashi from the Rav Acha from the second. Ravina, remember, Ravina says just putting it Rashid Arabim, it's already yours. Rav Acha said only if you put it in your own hands, if you put it in the public domain, it doesn't work unless you transfer it to your own hands. But just in the public domain wouldn't normally work. Ravina Diet Mihresha, what does it say? Hayam Oshkoviotse umate bereshut balin patul. So now. Tama Balim. It says if it dies in his house, still the owner's house. Sounds like how would see Omi Balim Vamate if you took it out of the owner's house and it died? Chayab, you'd be liable. Rav Achadiet Niseifa. He biho Oshotzio. He says, look at these two words. It says lift it or carry it out. Hotza Dumiya da Hagbaha. Magbaha da Ate Lirishute. Hagbaha only works if you get to your reshut. Right again, I told you, if I lift something in your house, it's not mine. So also would have to come into your own domain. Would it work in Rashid or Rabin? So now they're going to say the obvious, which is the Ravacha Kasha Resha. Will Ravina Kasha say for what does each one do with the other one's proof? Resha the Ravacha Lo Kasha Kamadu Lo Ati Lirishute Rishu Balim Krina Be. When we say Rishu Balim, we just mean. As long as it hasn't left their domain, it doesn't mean their physical domain. It means until it gets to your house, it's still considered in the domain of the owner. So if I take your stolen item and I bring it through the public domain, it's still considered yours until I get it to my house. So Rishu Balim, he just understands more loosely, not meaning your house, your domain, your jurisdiction is over it until I get to my house. Ravina, what does he do? Uh, sorry, Resha, right. Seifa le Ravina lo Kasha. Because who says that just because it says the same rules apply to both? No, would have to be in your domain, but could be just taking it out into the public domain would be enough. 
And that's how we've used that. And with that, we'll finish today's stuff. And we'll pick up from the bottom here, which is a whole new topic uh, in tomorrow's Shi'or, which again, I said is Tish above. If you want, you can listen early or you can listen later. Um, again, custom is not to learn Torah on Tish above, other than things that are specifically related to Avelu, to this destruction, etc. Okay, have a Shabbat Shalom and a good fast.